Welcome, everybody. Um, so this is the roundtable for technology and games user research. Uh, we have our wonderful panel of participants. Um, quick intro. Uh, my name is Andre. I work at AWS. Uh, my remit is finding developing solutions for uh, game analytics, user research, uh, machine learning. Uh, so very curious to, to talk technology with uh, these folks. Um, so I'll, I'll pass it over to you to um, do little introductions. Please introduce yourselves and where you work. I get to go first. Hey, I'm Hannah Matil. I'm the team lead for research operations at Playtest Cloud. Hey, I'm Josh Rivers. I'm the UX research lead at Solston. I'm Chris Havlack. I'm a senior product manager at Monolith Productions, which is part of Warner Brothers. Uh, my background's really in analytics more than you are, but I work with UR teams a lot. Hello, I'm Veronica Zamido. I run a boutique agency specific on uh, games user research, supporting organizational growth and development, as well as playtesting execution. Hello, everyone. I'm Michael Dunning. I'm the Chief Growth Officer at Playtest Cloud. So my colleague with Hannah here. Colin Nice. Uh, I oversee gaming at a company called Alita. And uh, in previous life, I was on the researcher side. So I've been both vendor and researcher. So yeah. Hi, I'm Alan Al. Uh, most recently, I was a data scientist at Xbox. I'm now taking a stab at indie development. Awesome. Thank you all. So we have uh, three topics today. Um, first, we'll talk about how the pandemic has changed user research, what technologies and solutions folks came up with um, to for the situation where you can't bring people in a lab, um, and what if that is is permanent. Uh, we'll talk about a combination of analytics and user research. How do you effectively combine them? How do you make that a consistently uh, uh, positive experience? Um, and then the last topic is magic wand. If if what what do you have that you can't live without or what would you wish you had that would improve your life a lot um so well, let's get into it um first topic remote and virtual studies uh so I, i've heard from the conversations here um at game zero 23 uh that apparently the pandemic did have an effect um so how did how did that change i'll put up prompting questions on the screen and turn it over to our panel to share their experiences, thoughts, et cetera. Who wants to kick this off? Yeah, so Playtest Cloud, I guess to set the context here, is a remote-based playtesting and user research platform. So obviously when the pandemic kicked off, uh, being uniquely placed as a remote playtesting platform, uh, business uh, picked up a little bit. And so, my perspective this is in in my role was i got to work with many different teams research teams developers consumers insights teams from every type of company uh around the world every type of uh, game development company around the world solve this unique challenge of like okay traditionally we used to bring folks in to do research um how are we going to do it now and you know from us in this world of working in remote side of it we already knew the advantages of it and that allows for a lightweight easy to play test opportunities. And so um, what we're seeing right now, and a lot of folks came to us and said, hey, we're gonna do this short term, right? We're gonna embrace this short term because once this pandemic is over, uh, we're gonna get everyone back in house. But what we saw is that there's unique advantages of a play testing solution or a play testing remotely um, and user research remotely because there's advantages of time, efficiency, and accessibility. So right now we're gonna talk about panel size and, and getting folks in you're now able to tap in and get player insights from folks around the world. It doesn't have to be centralized in one location and um, not to mention the cost efficiencies around that. So I think, you know, when folks were immediately kind of like, oh, okay, this is gonna be short term, they realized this can actually work in parallel with lab-based testing. This can complement ongoing lab-based te uh, testing. There's a time and place for remote testing. I mean, like, yeah, I absolutely agree with all that. Um, you know, I think like in my perspective, kind of working across everything, I think the more the most interesting thing that happened with the pandemic as it relates to this kind of UXR in in this environment is just that the sample you can get is so much more deeper because you can find that specific type of gamer, 
and that specific type of play habit that's more representative to the larger gaming population as opposed to representative of the geographic location wherever your lab is right and sometimes that's if you like a lab in los angeles like you're going to get good representation in los angeles but like there are labs in like other parts of the world they're like is that really representative of the gaming universe or is that just representative of the city that you kind of live in right so i think that has changed things and i think that's changed things for the better now on the other side i think the challenges are like you know specifically like pc console like it's the hardware it's the isp like people don't know their isp speed so this challenge is there too right it's like oh yeah well we gotta make sure you have this type of graphics card and like i don't know what graphics card i have so like there's definitely kind of some uh, tripping going on as it, things become remote. And I think the perfect world is going to be some sort of hybrid where there's some sort of sample that's going to come from hybrid and some sort of or remote and some that's going to be on-prem still. I think one of the advantages that um, I noticed as well is not only can you access players from all over the world, which is, has its advantages just inherently the speed at which you can find a player in the Philippines or in Europe or in the U.S. is crazy right now. But in addition to that, it allows for so much more collaboration between teams. Like we've seen teams that want testers in the U.S., they're located in China and they want a researcher with a specific experience in a certain type of game research located in Europe. And because all these teams have moved to a remote-based um, operation and they're more used to testing remotely, it enables a lot of different parties to come together from all over the world to collaborate on a project, which typically would have been all in one city potentially, and that's a lot more limiting. Yeah, I, I would agree with everything that's been said so far. Actually, just to give a bit of context before my current role, I was in Iceland at CCP Games. So one of the big challenges there, and I just want to bring it up, is we were mostly testing with Icelanders, uh, but that's not the target population of that game. And so one of the things that actually even before the pandemic we were looking at was this remote testing. I think it's been a big proliferation of the technology that supports that. I will say, though, and maybe this is uh, you know a little bit uh, controversial. I actually think in-person testing does a lot still. So just want to really hit home that there's a space to do both, right? Uh, and at Solston, we do in-person and remote as well. And I think the in-person allows people to connect with those players just a little bit better than the remote. There's something that gets lost whenever you're looking at a screen for sure. At the same time, the accessibility of it is absolutely phenomenal and it does allow for a lot stronger data in that regard. So speaking of those challenges, the the sort of the the re remoteness of remote studies, um, what do you have any suggestions on how to make that better? Um, how to get past the the, the Zoom barrier, if you will? Um, how do we evolve this to the point that you made? You know, there's, there's value in both. Um, any thoughts there? I think that what has happened with the. Uh augmenting the number of remote testing is that even like more data has been starting to be collected. And I think that that could be overwhelming for the researchers. There's like more data points to figure it out. Everything is recorded. So it's pushing people to actually be more thoughtful about, you know, what's needed part of the setup of being remote versus is this something I want to track? Is this within my scope? Do I really need to video code every single section that happened here? So it's, I think it's a little bit of an awakening on like we have more data, but we don't necessarily need to crunch every single part of that data and how to make smart decisions to still answer your core research question without getting overwhelmed and keeping projects on time, on track and you know solid insights coming out of that. So it has been, you know, putting that up for the community and the researchers to to self-critique of, you know, are are you are you tight with your research and you know be smart about it. I think one of the challenges that this presents because it's the ease of use to get this type of data unlocks and what we've seen non-researchers are now actively participating in running research and play test. And for the teams that have established research operations, you lose a little bit of control of that, right? So they're like, oh, wow, wait a minute. I don't want my producers. I don't want my designers going out uh, rogue 
and doing this. And that presents some challenge of control and making sure that they had the research teams or the consumer insights teams have the ability to still have an impact. It's like, hey, here's how you understand this data, all right? And how you can understand these results and actually put make tangible choices. So it's, for us, what we've seen is fascinating is that we've got more different types of personas and profiles of developers and researchers and non-researchers using playtesting platforms. Um, and how do we how do we navigate that? Because there's more data now. There's more things to understand. And uh, yeah, so it does present a bit of a unique uh, challenge on that as well. I have to that. You just reminded me of a story that I heard recently where uh, I was told that <laughs> it's like someone just dropped a link in Discord and like, wait, what? And then like, then like, oh, and then during basically what you said, and like, that is uh, probably not representative. It's probably of the kind of, not to say Discord's a bad place, but you definitely, there's a type of user that goes to that platform relative to kind of anywhere else you could procure a sample from. So that just kind of popped in my head and that's super funny. Um, On top, what I was also going to add though, is just like, I think as the technology kind of becomes more peripheral across everything, right? Like I, I, my, my infosec brain goes, okay, well, what's secure? What's, what's the, like, and like every company is going to have a different definition of like what's defined as secure. So like some sort of standardization will kind of appear over time across various vendors and, and methods. But I think that's something I think about too. It's just like that bit. Uh, just to follow up on the technology piece. Um, I think there's also maybe the slight risk and you have to be a little careful that you might be self-selecting for people who are already comfortable with the technology. Um, and so maybe it's not a problem if, if you know, the game itself is, has a good spectrum of that already. It's already self-selecting for those people, but definitely, especially in the early days when the technology wasn't all that easy to use or set up, uh, you might just end up getting a lot of people who are already very technically adept, uh, which, which maybe it's, again, maybe it's okay. Uh, maybe that is the target audience you're going for, but you know, you have to just sort of account for it. So on that, just to dig into a little bit, um, are there ways that we can mitigate the bias, that, that potential bias with in-person studies, right? Because if you, if, if there's a technology self-selection going on, you know, potentially if you're on the same test virtually and locally, you can measure it. Does that, does that track? What do you think? Um, yeah, I, I would say probably yes. Uh, definitely yes. Um, my my suggestion is, I mean, maybe start with some in-person, trying to understand kind of what are those barriers? Uh, where are the, the friction points up front that you maybe want to, and you might want to adjust how you run the study just or set up the study to say, okay, well, this works, this doesn't work. Um, it's, a nice, it's always nice to do a pilot in, in the first place anyway. And maybe it'll help you refine that process so that when you get to the technology piece, you're trying to minimize the effect of that on the flow of, of, of the process. Chris, did you have... Okay. Okay. Hannah, did you want to continue on that point? So what I've seen work really well related to that is clients that do kind of a smoke test Right, they they get their study planned out, and if they want to run a massive study, which could be complicated for players to understand, maybe they have really specific criteria or or documentation that the players have to read beforehand. Uh, we do, um, yeah, a test first to just make sure players that maybe aren't there, really special, important, you know, unique players, just any any player can understand the test. And I think running through those kind of scenarios is is what you do in a lab anyway. You have someone testing the tech, you have someone working through you know, what is the flow of this test going to be? But there's also just utilizing tools that encompass all of the different steps pretty seamlessly. We noticed that we had some solutions at first that we cobbled together to make things work, to like interview players, for example, and that works, but the, the challenge is that players then have to jump through more hoops in order to be able to complete the test. And as the testing solutions that different companies and at Playtest Cloud have evolved, they've made it more seamless for players to be able to just sign in and do the test all in one place. So they're not having to additionally jump through the hoops of how do I log into my Zoom account and share my screen? Uh, it's just uh, a seamless process. And I think that we can even improve that, that user experience for the tester and for the researchers so that they're both just showing up to do the task at hand, which is ask some questions, see if they like the game and get that data collected.
since you said Zoom, I have to put this out there. Like Zoom and Google Hangouts are not meant for this type of work. And it's crazy how many teams and how many organizations like, oh, well, we just do Zoom or we use Google Hangouts and record. And you're like, oh, uh. <laughs> there's definitely better solutions. Like, obviously, I'm sure you guys are in, in that camp. Like, there's way better solutions of that and are ultimately also more secure. So I just want to put that out there. Right now. Of course. Could you name some of those solutions? Oh man, off the top of my head, no. I mean, honestly, um, I it escapes me, but I, I, I just, yeah, I know off the top of my head again. Sorry, man. But there's going to be better solutions. I mean, there has to be. Cool. Uh, any other yep. related enough? Um, I actually have very little experience doing virtual testing, and I think. Uh, Part of that is the security kind of concerns we're talking about uh, working on an in development, big AAA game. But I see huge uh, opportunity and usefulness to it, kind of like what Hannah was talking about, where we really want to have uh, users from a bunch of different geographical areas testing our game. You know, we have several labs in different parts of the country, but it's still only a, a, a small sample. Uh, so I see a huge need for it, but I'd love to hear, like, are there ways to overcome those those security issues with doing virtual testing? Maybe just to close on, on this topic number one section, that, yes, technology gets in the way, and we compare to the lab that you just have the person showing up, you have everything ready, and then even when thinking about how much time you're going to dedicate to this study, you have a pretty good sense. Like it, you have already done all the due diligence. So they walk in, cross the door, sit down, go through your script. You have things time. It's solid in that sense. And then when you ask them to log into Zoom or anything that is another tech and um, have executed research that was with people with uh, low technology and they would not have the the apps installed or they will know how to do it. So even like that has become part of your prep script. So you can like walk them through, you send the instruction beforehand that everyone brings instruction or they don't even know how to actually do it. So all of a sudden, like maybe it's something that was supposed to be maybe like a, a quick usability test or something like that, half an hour now is 45 minutes at least on that. And that should come become again part of the the planning that you do and what you want to the trade-offs. So I think that's what we need to think about it and get the best of both worlds based on what are you going to be your needs, what kind of people you want to have and account for that beforehand. Yeah, but I came up with one. <laughs> no, I not quite the full answer, but I will say this because I've seen this across even other sectors is I, I've seen companies that are more technologically savvy start building in-house solutions, right? So that's ultimately the most secure path, right? And that said, like that has its own weaknesses, like standing it up, maintaining it long-term, scaling it, yada, yada, yada. So there's that's not necessarily the best path, but I see security teams being like, that is the solution we're going to have to start leveraging and then bring in partners and other things like a plug in there. I want to dig into what, uh, what you were saying. Um, so by nature, like the study takes longer because suddenly you're not in a controlled environment, but by the same token, you know, the, the player is in their home, right? So the cat jumps on the screen, doorbell rings, stuff happens. Has that been a challenge at all? And to the extent that has it affected the quality of the study or the results? Uh, I think that I agree with you that they, that they are in their environment using their devices, like you cannot achieve any more line realistic than that. So it's actually pretty good that those things are happening and they get interrupted, the door starts barking. So it's a lot on the researcher or moderator or someone who is building that rapport. So now your intro, it, it's also putting the person at ease. Um, participants get self-conscious about their background or their messiness or like the something happening in the house. So how you now nurture a bit more that relationship and continue to put them at ease and allow them that it's fine. 
uh, in the same way that you know every researcher would say like we're not testing you it's testing the game you know, there are no mistakes now the other part is like yeah it's you know no worries yes they you know take care of that they might interrupt for a, a few minutes and I welcome that I think that is actually sometimes many really good data points of even how they play and they start sometimes you know volunteering a bit more like oh yes I have you know my child or my they get on the dog or whatever and that brings even uh good nuggets of information in how they they play the games more uh, on an ongoing basis so again the welcome hurdles of real life awesome yeah, I, th I think I just want to add and say that's actually really valuable data, right? So I, we we sometimes pretend, right, that if we put people in a lab, it's very clinical, it's pure data is something I've heard a few people toss around at some point. And the reality is the purest data is how are people playing these games when they're actually at home playing these games or on the road with a mobile game, right? So totally agreed. It's actually a really interesting data point to me when something happens like a cat jumps up. Because cats are going to jump on your keyboard when you're playing a game, right? Or they're going to jump on your lap. How do you react? Is, and how do you also get distracted from the game and come back to it too? So there's a lot of really rich insights to be gained there. But I think sometimes we try to do away with the context of players and we need to actually bring that back. So that's really useful whenever we're doing these kinds of remote tests in my mind. But of course, the rapport is important too, to make sure they're comfortable. That brings up another group of players, which remote testing enables you to access and it's not just players across the world it's players that maybe can't leave their house super easily you know maybe it's for accessibility reasons they aren't as mobile or maybe it's that they're a mom with their child and they just can't get away from the duties that they have at home and enabling people who otherwise might not be able to as easily come into your lab to give their opinions on the game and to voice their their yeah their perspective on what you've developed gives you a wider perspective on how the game will actually be received and it's because you can go into people's homes and offer them the opportunity to do that very cool yes of course so it's funny because pre-pandemic it was like oh we should do ethnographic research and la 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 and that used to be a, a method measured around you know the hallways of the GERD summit all the time and there was like these golden opportunity of like getting in people's home and that would be so valuable and now that we are better equipped to do that it's like oh i want, I want my lab back <laughs> so, well yes it's just embrace both so we, you can now do digital ethnographic research awesome embrace both it's a, it's a good wrap up to the topic anybody else want to say anything before we move on to the next one Good. Okay. All right. So topic number two, um, analytics and user research. Um, in my past around analytics teams, worked with user research. Um, so wanted to hear your thoughts about what good coordination, collaboration between analytics and user research looks like. And in going through this question, it was the, the, the model that I started, landed on, and I hope you can Take it further. Uh, it's do you, do you enable the user researchers to access that? Or to run their own queries, roll their own dashboards, whatever. Like, do you make it part of um, uh, mixed methods, or do you pair up analytics analysts, analysts with user researchers in a, in a sort of cross-functional team so they can like collectively make a make a better uh, insight? Who wants to take it away? So, so I. I'm a fan of having, I don't know, it's sort of weird because I do think that they are very closely related. Um, I kind of consider both roles to be in the same kind of family of topics because they're ultimately all trying to understand what the player is doing. Um, but sort of thinking about it a lot, especially from the data side, I think there is maybe a risk of getting a little bit of tunnel vision, uh, especially if you have data, uh, there's a tendency to to kind of focus in on what the data is telling you, but you might not be able to sort of think about topics that aren't exposed in the data. Uh, and this is where I think having that user research framework is good because that allows you to kind of break away from that. Um, but I, I suspect that maybe there's also, it's, it's bi-directional. Um, there, there may be questions you want to answer that you can't get the data for, or the data is not available for. And, and so I think that conversation has to happen, but that's why I think like they pair really well. 
Uh, other folks? Yeah, I've worked with uh, mostly as an analyst with user research teams for about nine years now and seen a bunch of different models. Um, the, yeah, very similar in that both supporting the dev team with with insights from the player behavior or the player uh, thought processes. Um, what's the, one thing that often happens is, you know, we'll do a play test and there'll be an analytics report and then there'll be a user research report and they'll cover sort of the same topics, um, but in a, a fragmented way. And what I've actually seen work the best uh, in my experience is really treating the two groups as a unified insights team. So as you're as you're leading up to a test, you're talking about this, the questions you want to ask and the same objectives and the, the user research needs are actually uh, driving a lot of the analytics you want to include. And then once the once the play test happens, you're you're both uh, both producing findings and where possible, you know, if you have some combat findings, you put the, the data together from both sources. Um, and it's just it's it's a really great opportunity to. Um, to see both both data sets together, but, but yeah, they won't always be related, but sometimes they will, and it's it's your only chance to to look at the analytics data of what the players actually do, but also get a little bit into the why and the thought process that you normally wouldn't get if you're just doing analytics in a live game or or much later on. Um, and yeah, the final point is treating it treating them as kind of one team helps you be allies when you're overcoming all those things we've we've talked to heard a lot of talking about yesterday of how do we communicate with the devs and gain trust with the devs and and make them trust us if you're working in tandem as as allies um that, that's yeah solving the alliance problem and, and already being a louder voice and combined effort No, I, I think you're setting up the, the right stage, like I totally 100% agree that it should be one team and that it should be working together. And uh, that's way of working that I, uh, my time at uh, DA when I was the director of UX research there, really close collaboration with analytics. We were belonging to the same team. Uh, and then I also, you know, with another game company is helping clients to actually do put those two teams together and have like an insights group that can actually collaborate extremely closely and create those roadmaps and those reports. And I wish actually I would, I push people to like, they should not be two reports. There should be one report that the analyst and the researcher should co-author co together. Uh, otherwise you're just like dumping the work to the developer and it's so like i invite everyone to you know stand up and own that as i feel like that's the responsibility of the insights team rather than you know read one or the other one and, and you connect the dots like uh, no you you can definitely do better and then then the trick is i think that we all inherently understand that so it's like well how you actually do do it because in every single place um there are challenges to get to that place. And sometimes is uh, from an organizational point of view, sometimes those team belongs to different orgs. Uh, sometimes the possibility could be like to organize and rework where they're in the same umbrella and kind of force a little more connection. It's not your only choice or option for that. Uh, you should also maybe like just behave how you want that to be, even if they, belong into completely different uh, works and actually do make that happen and give a bit more of visibilities. Everyone is very smart in, in this community, and but sometimes things get lost in translation or where the emphasis that they think about it. So I think it just takes a little bit of more of time to explain to each other, this again, to a smart people, what they are really trying to uh, communicate and find that common language. And sometimes I have some shared tools as well, a little bit more like self-serve for each other and being the enabler of your peer. That to me is like the, the, the core of what to aspire to like overcome that, those barriers that um, 
sometimes get like self-imposed such as yeah no write the report together do it behind the curtain don't be lazy your stakeholder will highly appreciate it and own it and you'll grow with that and be a, a good peer helping that translation and again like there should not be no competition it should be like a one team team of insights and uh be a co-author yeah so we've worked with a lot of folks that have that one team approach and what's been fascinating going back to the advantages of of this remote virtual play testing and, and research options is unlocks more points to then because clearly when the data is, is they're identifying a mix mix match between game design and player experience and so if you have a team is closely aligned and they're identifying those data points they say okay now we've got a cost effective easy lightweight solution to go and then look into it and so i think the teams that we, that have that really tight foundation of working with uh, insights of, of data analytics and researchers they're able to test early and often they're able to not so it's, it's it's something where if you have that together it's it's great and what we've seen that from a lot of our customers who have really scaled up the usage is because they're looking at data points and they're saying we need to look into that why that's actually happening from a qualitative approach than just pure looking at the data i mean i think people are pretty much covered it so i was just kind of go to the, the the kind of concept of just like allies to kind of go up and like kind of the idea of managing up but i think that's been a topic kind of consistently throughout um, the summit and like I, I, when i think of like talking to the business unit side of the business like which is ultimately where these reports go like having a single vision or at least a narrative has a lot more advantages to both sides of the fence as opposed to going with two different reports that may have slightly different perspectives because business people will then cherry picking what they want to hear and like play both against each other right so that's i think that shared and it's not and I want to say like it's not malicious on their end. They just kind of hear what they hear, right? So having that shared point of view is going to really strengthen that kind of the narrative you want to push upwards. Michael, I wanted to dig into what you said because it it must be a little bit unique working as a vendor. Uh, folks who are in the panel are all the same boat. Um, because you, do you get access to the customers' telemetry as as part of your study, or do they sort of take your report and and then compare it to behind the scenes what they know? Like how? How does that work or how should it work? I don't think I can answer how it should work. Uh, I think it, it's they take it from our platform and then they compare, right? It's not integrated like that, but there's a lot of uh, overlap and there's a lot of integration and collaboration on that. I think at the end of the day, it's just the ease of use to get those player insights on specific moments where you're seeing things are happening and then making sense of that data points with stories. And then um been able to show those points and say you know clip it here's the here's where we're seeing those drop-offs or frustration but whatever it is now here's a reel of all those moments those five second clips of this is what's happening here's these players having that experience uh yeah so most of the time no uh, as also a vendor in that space telemetry is really tough to come by and there's a lot of security concerns actually that come up and it's it's interesting to work uh, kind of between the spaces, but going to Michael's point, like understanding the story and understanding the questions behind it and trying to tell that same story is is really uh, important. Uh, and I think this actually goes to the question of like the alliance, right? So how do you build those proper alliances between analytics and user research? It's all about helping each other to, to tell stories in a comprehensive manner, right? So uh, that would be just the only thing I would add about telemetry. I think one thing that also relates to this is um getting away from the assumption that every team that's using these methods of testing now is a big team that has a developed telemetry like system and a department that's doing all this anal analysis and also a user research team like a lot of these are very small teams that still need to get these insights maybe even more so because they don't have a lab in they're already operating out of a really small office right so um a lot of these solutions enable them to say We've got a little bit of data from this game that we're developing. Okay, that's our starting point. And where do we go from there? And the flexibility of, of having solutions that are out of lab enables them to say, okay, we're going to run a small test. Oh, we got some information from that. Can we check that against the telemetry? Can we make some changes, iterate upon this and do this over and over? And in a small way, instead of having these big teams that are producing large scale reports for high up stakeholders in a small manner are saying we're making drastic impact on the game um, with the means that we have and the tools that we have available to us.
So I spend an abnormal amount of time building telemetric hooks and it is not easy. And like, you know, even the largest organizations, it's it's a really time consuming thing. And then on top of that, you kind of on the other side, like their query tables have to be spot on, right? So the data, like if it's bad data in, it's going to be bad data out, right? So like on the on the client side, that that's like a whole kind of thing they have to think through on their end. And on our end, it, it's easy, but like much like security, privacy laws, as those evolve, I mean, the stuff that's, you know, happening across like social right now in terms of where data residency is, is becoming an issue. So like, there's a lot more challenges there, um, I think. Um, and then I'll, obviously, like big companies have a much easier time to do this, whereas smaller companies, it becomes an opportunity cost thing. It's like, well, we can make a, a new card or we could do this telemetric hooks into these systems. And it's like, well, the new card is going to generate this much money. And it's unknown with the telemetric stuff. So like, that's always a challenge too, for, especially for smaller studios. Uh, so, so just going back to sort of this, you know, looking at the data piece of it also, I think there's more value kind of at the downstream end of you come up with some thing that you've identified and you say, hey, we think this needs to change. Uh, and I think later on, you're going to come back and say, okay, we changed it. Did it have any effect? Uh, and that is, I think, one place where the data can be really valuable is just understanding, okay, how are we going to figure out if we made a change and it did something. Um, and and just, I think it's useful to think about that upfront also. Uh, the challenge sometimes is if you're just getting clear feedback, like it's not clear how you want to translate that or measure that. Uh, again, sometimes you can feel constrained by, oh, well, we're going to measure it by revenue, but is that really what you're going for? Is that going to be the good measure of whether you had a positive impact on the experience? Um, I mean, maybe yes, uh, but it doesn't have to be that. It can be kind of whatever you want, but having that relationship with the dev team can also really enable you to think about how do we want to how do we want to figure out if we change something and it made things better. It's a good segue to a bit of a curveball I wanted to throw in here. Um, what about A/B testing during a study? So we, you know, there are folks who do A/B testing in a live game, millions of players. Uh, but is there an application or a recommendation we can make to the audience of how to do that well or whether to do it thoughts so when i first got to ccp ab testing was the only thing the team knew um so i will say that ab testing is an interesting tool especially in relatively ux research immature environments i found just to help people latch on to what is it that you're trying to do uh, I love A-B testing. I also worked with a great analytics team who were really solid at building in A-B tests. And one thing that we would often do is actually, okay, hey, we have these two these two options here. We'd actually like you to actually go out and interview folks or run a session and see if they pick up on, on this and give us a little bit more contextual information there. So as an instrument, I think it can be really, really powerful, especially once you bring in a bit more user research to have some context to why people are maybe choosing option A over option B. Awesome. Thanks. Does anybody else want to pick that one up? Cool. All right. Thank you. Any other thoughts on analytics? Okay, cool. So we'll move on to the next and final topic. Um, magic wand. You wish for a thing, for a tool, for a technology um, that doesn't, that you don't currently have, but would really like, or you have a thing that you will never let go. It's, it's your, it's their lifeline. Uh, you can't live without it. Um, what are those? This is a curveball, dear curveball. But if I had a magic wand, I would make uh, data regulation be succinctly the same worldwide because I think that's going to be a massive challenge in this space as it just becomes bifurcated by country, state, et cetera. It's just like that is a massive challenge. And I think it's just going to get amplified and get worse. That's a great call out. If I had a magic wand, I would give myself the superpower to find every single tester that has the most niche target audience like specification. They play that one game at level 4,000 and spend like $800 a month or something like that is my wish with my magic wand. I would be able to fly to those people and get them to sign up for our platform so I could play test with them. <laughs> Uh, I think my magic wand would be actually, and this is why I asked that question earlier, a system that you could do remote testing that is thoroughly secure uh, for builds that you cannot have leaks with. And I don't know that that solution exists. I would love to see it exist somewhere. That would be my magic wand. 
I'm going to have two answers. The, uh, <laughs> uh, the first one is uh, yeah, infinite engineering resources to put in, uh, <laughs> put in analytics uh, hooks. Uh, even though I'm at a big company, it's still always an opportunity cost of do we work on features or do we, we put in telemetry and and you know i want features i want the game to exist so i you can't push too hard to get the analytics in um the other the other big challenge is just the the cadence of trying to do a test do a report uh deliver those insights to the team and have them be able to react in time for like the next test which might be by the time you get them insights it might be too late so some sort of time dilation device um, but, but more seriously, there, there may be some tech and having analytics dashboards ready to go and things like that, uh, pre-existing templates. There's probably some methodologies that can actually, um, solve that without a magic wand. My magic wand move would be a chat GPT for use of research repository. I think that all the teams and all providers, we generate so much knowledge, right? And we think about like, oh, here's the report, here's the report. The report has a finite amount of time on the shelf. And after that, things change it. But when you look at them all together over time in your beautiful hard drive or you know cloud, but it's in a folder somewhere, uh, there's so much know how that it gets in it and there is so much research that sometimes get repeated and could be shorter faster better trends but i i see that prime way too often in way too many companies I think again everyone uh, struggles with that on how to make your knowledge alive and serve you for that such as trends, how did the player experience has been changing with this, uh, being able to pull the data, look at it, like compare different games, compare longitudinally with one product and how to better utilize your own kind of database of information and being able to pull that out. Um, and, you know, on top of that, from a purely database perspective, then if you can have these like meta insights or reports that it will be available and that your stakeholders could actually go and self-serve and, and read those reports that would be uh, amazing. And, you know, doing those searches and being able to pull them together would be, it would empower so much uh, everyone. So that would be my wish. Magic one, I'm gonna build on that, Veronica. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, so my, it's gonna to, to serves two purposes here and it's magic, so why not? We're gonna go for it. Uh, compressing the time it takes to bring together all those key highlights and sentiment and moments that you need to drive the point home of why you even conducted that research in the first place. Because with qualitative research, and it, you can it could produce a lot of data. It takes time, um, and that's you you. There's a lot of effort, and you get away from some of the big brain stuff you need to do on it. And so, like, how can you get to this point? those surface the the most important stuff that you guys can do and the researchers in the house can do the stuff that you get paid to do and that's step one right so how do we compress that time to surface those moments step two and i don't know if you guys were in the session yesterday with kurt but he was talking about delivering this these reports these insights to stakeholders so my magic wand would be like how can it be done in a way that it doesn't actually have to be a whiskey bottle report that it could be something that's really i think he's mentioned it like when he had bad news to report it's something that could be consumed and realized and take an action item for it doesn't matter who the stakeholder is when it is but it's it's actionable and it's repeatable so um because i think it, that's the key thing how would it get to and because that will unlock a lot of other opportunities if we can just compress time get to reports that we're going to have an impact that's going to be received if it's good or bad from the stakeholders that need to see it. I have one more to add on that. And I'm sorry, but I would say like, is there a magic wand where you can have anyone who is a direct customer of data insights to understand how to read data and in insights? <laughs> like, cause I think that's also a missing gap. You know, people just kind of tend to cherry pick or take misconstrue things and just having an under basic understanding of how to read data would be an amazing thing across all, all stakeholders. Uh, and I've got two things. The first one is more low hanging fruit. It's more of a, like, I just wish we had a data dictionary that was always updated, just always. Uh, 
Um, and mostly that's just talking about the relationship between the devs and, and the data folks and the analytics folks and the research folks. Uh, just so we know, it's like, what do we have? And like, what does this mean? That would be great. Uh, the other one is more speculative. And that's like, it's, I wish we had better attribution for we changed X and it led to Y. Because we'll see a change in Y and we'll be like, well, we changed X. Is that what caused Y? And if we could like have perfect attribution, that would be my magic wand wish. Okay, awesome. Thank you. This this really cool magic wishes. Uh, so that is the end of our official topics, um, but there is time for Q&A. Um, so if anybody's... All right, here we go. So just to repeat, the question is, have, have security concerns, make sure I get this right, have security concerns come up? And if so, how have you dealt with them and have they affected your ability to, to work with people? Who wants to take that one? Yeah, it's a big concern, uh, especially when you're working with larger studios, with big projects that aren't announced. Uh, it's, it's a big one. Uh, honestly, this goes back to what I was saying about the cost benefit, right, of remote versus in person. So there's a lot of times where you'd, you'd actually need to bring it in person to mitigate that risk. I mean, during the pandemic, there were solutions. I'm, I think we're probably all familiar with Parsec, right? And that's a tool that has a lot of solid security built in, but it's also laggy, so it doesn't work perfectly every time. Uh, there have also been times, and actually this is why I like Google Meet and some of the, the tools on Zoom as well, where you can see somebody maybe pulling out their phone to take a screenshot or a picture, and you can just cut the connection right away. So you have to talk about that. I think there's also a level of trust that you have to build. But to be really candid, I think ultimately you have to admit, sometimes you can't mitigate all those risks, and you have to find an alternative solution that can serve that purpose. Yeah, what, what I think also contributes to this is realizing that there are different approaches that you can take simultaneously to mitigate risk. So it's not just having players sign an NDA. It's not just technical measures that are built into certain software that is a kill switch, for example, or records the screen. It's doing a combination of all of these things as a, as a, as a more of a blanket type of security rather than saying we're relying on this one thing and if it fails, then we're out of luck. I think that they are pointing in the right direction of um, a lot of companies, they want the most secure, you know, push bills remotely, wipe them remotely and have them, you know, no screen, print screen um, shortcuts. And that's all fine. But yeah, even if you're lucky to, you know, catch someone, if they're trying to pull out their phone, like they might have another camera that is set up before. So the, the risk is is going to be there and it starts from within and having a kind of like a security plan about what are you going to do or like what's the level what is the acceptable level of risk for this product at this moment in time on development and have actually have helped companies to develop that like a security matrix of like red, yellow, green zones, and that everyone understands what is at risk uh, and what you'll be you know, tolerating to accept and have that sincere conversation that all the stakeholders are on the same page of, do we want to uh, accept this risk at this moment of time? And is the research going to give me um, so much information that even if that happens, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm willing to to do that. Uh, that that's the only thing. Like nothing is going to be bulletproof. So yeah, multiple approaches will like help to lower that you know potential risk. But you have to have your like playbook on what is at stake and do I want to put that risk and have your stakeholders, your URT, your security team, your community, and all the other parties that sometimes go invisible in the background, like monitoring Reddit, is someone talking about this thing or, you know, trying to catch it um, easily because once the leak is done, that what are you going to, you know, follow and it's like, oh, I'm going to suit you, that the damage is done. So you have to know what are you going to play for that. Yes, we have a... Um, it was mostly 
section one, and it's probably already been promoted all after it starts. Uh, this is usually to understand why doing a remote search leads to more data than an in-person making that dependent on that remote. So just to make sure I understand, that does remote, sorry, can you restate? Not, not sure why. You didn't understand why remote research leads to more data than doing your search in, in person. Isn't that dependent upon methodology? Okay. Okay, sounds good. Um, I think the uh, uh, got picked up for uh, the subtitle, so I'll um, send you when I take that one. I have a feeling this is about my cat comment. Uh, so I will actually say that I don't think it's more data, it's different data, and it's it's a novel set of data in the remote world, right? And uh, even the word more with data is always a weird one. Like what is more data, right? It's always a different perspective. It's a different kind of lens that you're working with. So does remote provide more? N no, it provides different. And I think if we acknowledge that, then we're able to work with what that different is in a way that answers the questions we're interested in answering. I, I would say that, yes, more data is collected in a uh, playful manner. It's just that they are more, uh, you lose that control environment. So things are going to happen. The, the cat on the keyboard, the child crying, the male person dropping something, and they need to you know make sure that they put inside the house right away. So uh, those, uh, and those things lead to potentially people sharing more stuff that you were originally thinking about it. Um, and also you have the recordings that you could have done, in, yes, in the lab, but they're like little blips that are going to appear here and there. Uh, and also you have to sometimes like, you know, double down into what are you going to be collecting because you want to secure that, that things don't get lost in the technology. So sometimes you have like, you know, another backup or another recording, things like that. Yeah, I'm not sure if it's more or less. Uh, I do think methodology plays in and the outcome and the objectives you're going for. I just think that there's, and I agree with what Josh was saying, I think it's it's frequency is increased. I think you can do more now and you see more of those fast iterative type of test. So I don't know if that is more than that, but it is. I think it's just it produced because you can do it more frequently now, remote. Does that answer the question? Right on. Got one in the back. Sure. So just to restate, uh, does anybody have experiences uh, with accessibility research um, in a context where somebody needs to be at home to to participate? Does that, does that roughly cover it? Okay. Does anybody want to take that one? I am not an accessibility researcher. Let me caveat this by, by saying that first. Uh, but actually, we we worked with quite a few people who um, needed some sort of accommodation when we were working on Evo Online, be that a screen reader or uh, just needing to be in the home environment. Uh, tips in that space, I mean, be a human, <laughs> uh, you know, accommodate to the extent that you can. But also, there is a certain point where you have to realize an accommodation maybe, you know, puts a security risk in place. And it goes back to what Veronica was saying about the conversation you have to have with stakeholders of that kind of, hey, is this is this going to be okay for you? Uh, so that would be my only tip is just to, you know, try to connect with the person and understand on a deep level what that is. My other tip is hire somebody who's a pro at this, honestly. I mean, it, it's a cost, but there's something to be said for having an expert on your team who you can go to and say, hey, I, I don't understand this fully. Could you help color this in so that we can actually accommodate this person? I realize it's also quite a privilege to have a headcount for somebody fully focused on accessibility, but I think it's an important one. It's something that I've seen uh, diving into the accessibility realm is that actually remote is way better because they have already all their setups properly. 
Um, so actually, I think that remote testing for accessibility is uh, better suited uh, just to overcome a lot of uh, adjustments that the person would need that uh, are going to be working for sure. So there's like some uh, guidelines that people have developed for in-lab test on making sure you have your speech to text uh, enabled um, as an example. Uh, and those need to be like quickly, easily uh, available. But the folks already on their home, they have all that set up and actually always um, bring a, a good point of information about what they actually do want to use and how they use it. So I, I think I would ultimately say like, uh, acknowledge that, do your prep, but actually um, jump for that and try to do as much remote. I think it's going to open the eyes to like the real needs and the real usage, uh, and then translate that into your lab environment uh, later on. Sure. Just a quick plug, and it's not it's a, a group that I have worked with in the past. Able gamers have a lot on this space, so I would definitely check check them out if you're really interested in accessibility work. Yeah. Good call out. I've got like maybe one more from the chat to the copy out. Sure, let's do it. Sure. We can do the in-person ones here. So the question is your thoughts on AI solutions in this space. I mean, AI is going to make it so one person could do an infinite amount more work because it's going to be able to take the kind of the the qual part and I'll run it through an NLP, give you pretty accurate sentiment, moments to zoom in on, right? To kind of call out. So it's going to be able to scale the sheer amount of work a person's able to do. Um and I mean that's it's super cool. I can get really nerdy about it, but yeah. I agree. I think there's no way moving forward that um, using these newer testing methods, we're not going to be able to avoid using AI and it's going to be only a benefit. But I think um, the application is what's going to make the difference because is the way that you're actually utilizing the AI blinding you for maybe the results that you actually need to see because it's operating in a specific a specific number of commands that you've given it in a way that um, it might take you down a path without you realizing that um, actually the insights that you're getting could be misleading. And I think at this point, uh, a lot of us feel probably comfortable that if you're a user researcher, you know what pitfalls maybe to avoid, but the challenge is going to be making sure that the AI is avoiding those same pitfalls and that when you're, we're getting to a place where a lot of that's becoming automated, that the user researcher can actually see that the AI has avoided those pitfalls, I think, because at some point, maybe it's processing the information in this kind of black box and the results that you're getting are something that you're questioning. Can I fully test? Can I fully trust like that? This is the, this is the true result. Uh just really quickly to add to the pitfalls, one of the really big things to think about with AI too is who built it and what was their perspective when they built it. Uh, there's some great academic research on this. I'm not going to drop names, but uh, one of them is Wit Pow. Uh, and they've done some great work on looking at like how the algorithms that you build are actually influenced by the person's lived experience who built them. So just going into pitfalls, right? So having AI just be acknowledging that would also be something to be cognizant of. We keep passing down the the table. Um, actually, I, I was playing a little bit with uh, AI and again Chat GPT. And for example, like giving prompts about like write a script for this type of game with this kind of objective. And actually, I was surprised. It was like not too bad actually. Uh, it had like good points. I was like, yeah, that's. It's almost like you had a little bit of a template with some on the fly adjustments. I mean, I would have never run with that script, but it was really interesting that it is kind of like a little bit of a, like a bouncing ideas, uh, at least at the current level that is operating. If you have uh, like a sanity check that you want to do a little bit like what would happen and have like that more like immediacy. So for writing the scripts, not there yet. And it doesn't have all the nuances, but a kind of like like a checklist kind of like reminder is 
handy and playful. And then if you just put like a bunch of responses, the aggregation is actually, again, not too bad, but I would, if I were receiving a report with that synthesis that it did, I would be like kind of like rolling my eyes that it's so generic that it's telling me nothing. So it's not getting into the nuance.